you made a, a move from Detroit to Nashville, what, in the mid-2000s? Yeah, 2005, somewhere around there. Why Nashville? At that time, it was getting really hard. It was sort of the backlash of, because the, the, the garage rock scene in Detroit was kind of small, so the backlash from the, the White Stripes' success was pretty heavy, and it was sort of, couldn't go to a bar and watch a band anymore, and it was getting a lot of cynicism, and it was pretty rough to, to even to try to go out and, and be with that crowd anymore. Because of the success that you yeah, guys were having? everybody had a different take on it. A lot of your, our own friends didn't know how to relate to it. I didn't know how to relate to it, for sure. I didn't know how to talk about it or not talk about it. You know, and sometimes these things would happen. Like, we're going to go, where are you going tomorrow? Well, we're going to London. And it'd be like, oh. you know, I'm like, well, you asked me where I was going. <laughs> I, so Nashville, I thought, you know what's cool about this? It's sort of got this plastic country music business thing happening that maybe I can just be here and do my own thing and no one will bother me. Because everyone's more focused on country hits and songwriting and stuff, publishing, that I can kind of do my own thing here. And, and, right. and even Third Man Records opening there was kind of like, this is great. We can get away with murder here. We just do whatever we want. There's no cynicism in this town. I mean, if you're up on a billboard in Nashville and you're a star, you, you did good. Sure. You know, and not in Detroit. If you know, I was up on a billboard, I'd be laughing, laughing stock. Did you feel there was a, that Detroit had an imprint on the stuff that you did up until 2005 and then subsequently Nashville has a, a different imprint. My, my favorite rock and roll album is the Stooges uh, Funhouse, their second album. And I, I think there's just something that just bleeds and oozes rock and roll. I think they were trying to record their live set in a studio setting. And there's something so rock and roll about it and so Detroit about it that that, that album is very, very much in my blood. And I, I feel like that's in me for life. But in Nashville, what's different is when we're doing a session we'd, and I would produce a record like, say, Tom Jones or Beck would come in and record something, a 45 for Third Man, and say, hey, we need a, a fiddle player and someone who plays harp uh, on this. Uh, Tom wants to do uh, Jezebel. Can we get a harp? You know, they're there because the town, the town is just full of musicians and session people and guys writing songs. I mean, you, you couldn't do that in Detroit. You know, you, you couldn't just snap your fingers and all of a sudden a, a, a fiddle player shows up. So that that's pretty cool about Nashville. But it seems like Third Man in Nashville has also been, it's like the significant part of the, the story in that Third Man it has a, like you're saying, it, it, there's no cynicism. That, mm -hmm. I like that. And it, it you've opened a Third Man now in Detroit, but I wonder, like, I'm thinking out loud here. If you had opened it in Detroit first, that it that wouldn't may, have it wouldn't have been the same no, thing. No, it, it would know? it would have closed down within a year. Uh, we had to go do that first. You had to leave town and come mm -hmm. back. You know, they know you. They've been with you since you were young. They remember you when you were you know a kid and making mud pies first or something, time. or they remember when they they saw your first show. So, um, you have to kind of walk away from that and come back. Sure. I think there's a lot of ways you can never really go home. That made sense for Third Man was to go away, and we got to do it there, and we're always with the hope of, well, hopefully we can go back to Detroit and do this there, and, and the time was right. It felt great, and Detroit's going through this incredible resurgence now. I'm glad to be a part of a small part of that because it's just a beautiful a beautiful renaissance happening. Do you there. feel that, that the negative elements of Detroit that you talked about mm -hmm. before, is that sort of I think it's gone? going away. I think there's, you know, there's definitely, a, you know, through the Rust Belt, you know, all the way through to New England, down through Ohio, Pittsburgh, you know, Pennsylvania, through to Detroit, Milwaukee, that Rust Belt, those are those are blue collar people there, man. They're they're you know they're serious and they they take what they like seriously and they're um, I wouldn't say that the word jaded or anything like that, but I would say that they 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 don't fall for you know fluffy sh they, 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 they like what they like for real reasons. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> I think uh, we can all test to that at yeah. some level. Yeah. You have a little bit, I guess, sort of tied into, um, which I think is really interesting. You're doing a, a if I have it correct, no cell phone mm -hmm. kind of thing, something yeah. about park your cell phone in a plastic bag or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Tell this me about a, that. This is wild. This is Chris Rock, again, he had done this uh, comedy show at Third Man, and he had he, he was testing out that new material. That sounds like it was quite a day between you it and was. Chris Rock. There was, was a, a lot of was. things that came out of that. It was. <laughs> we found a lot of common ground. and uh, But what? But, but I'll, I'll tell you why. Because when I don't have... Because I, I don't have a set list. I really react to the crowd just like a stand-up comedian would. If a stand-up comedian goes on stage and they tell a couple of jokes and they hear crickets... They know, okay, those Donald Trump jokes aren't working for this crowd. I got to go switch over to this kind of material. And they go and start talking about this. And that's working. Okay, now I got them on a roll and I'm going to keep going. That's how I work with no set list. If I finish a song and it's ta-da and it's crickets, I'm like, well, I don't know what to do now. Am I supposed to play a heavier song, a faster song? Do you want me to play acoustic? Do you want me to leave? 
You guys want me to leave? I'll leave. I mean, you know, uh, but what, what I don't like is, is that how they really feel or are they just not even paying attention because they're not engaged because well, they're doing course, this, yeah. they're texting. And so when he, I saw him do that, he was trying to protect, uh, uh, he was just, I want to test out jokes and I don't want them to get on YouTube because I don't know if they're going to be any good yet. So I'm playing these small clubs, locking your phones in a bag and they hand you the bag. You carry the bag with you, this little pouch. And it has the phone. Well, you just can't access it. If you want to access it, you just step out of the hall, step out of cool. the room, and unlock it, and you can use it. So um, I thought, that's brilliant. This is going to be the first like a major, I think, music tour to, to, to use this. But what we were doing before was Lala would go out and ask the crowd, can you please not raise your phones that. up? I remember that. And the yeah, crowd would cheer and say, yeah, we're on the side of that. We love that I idea. And then they were still doing it. But what uh, they were doing, yeah, yeah. but the, what they were doing was they, instead of holding it up, they were just going down here and texting and, and whatever, doing all that. It's still not engaged because when you go to a movie theater, a symphony, church, whatever, there are all these moments in life where people put those away and, and engage. And um, I love the idea of rock concerts being punk as hell and there's no rules. I love that. But I don't like the idea that I have no idea what to say, play next. And I need, I need that. Or Because I've walked off stage like, man, I'm really... I really don't know what to do anymore. If this is going to be how, how it's going to be from now on, it's going to be sure. very difficult for me to play. I might have to start having set lists and really figuring out how to connect with him. Because another thing is I don't have those gigantic FM radio hits where I can like hit them with that and there's you know a festival of 100,000 people singing along. It's like I got one or two things like that, but I don't have like, you know, you, if you're the Chili Peppers or Green Day, you can go and hit them with 15 songs of the sure. 100,000 people know every word. And obviously you guys too. I don't have that. So I'm working in a little bit of a different scenario. It's hard to believe that anybody who appreciates you, respects you, and is a fan of yours would not 100% support this position. I mean, it's mm. it's weird that if there would be any, I don't know what the... It's been, it's, been, it's been sort of like skeptical, but I think really positive so far. And we did it a couple, we did it in Third Man Entertainment. People, people loved it at Third Man in a small venue. No, but it's really, I mean, it is really cool that you can't, it is really cool that if you want to go see Chris Rock, that you can't just go on YouTube and see all the material Mm -hmm. you know, before you go or whatever. So there is still yeah, an element still something of new, yeah. something that you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, imagine that. Because when you were a kid, if you saw Deep Purple came to town, you had no idea what set they played no, last night. No, of course not. And you had no idea what they were going to do tomorrow. Well, you, you were just there in that moment, and that was beautiful, and you took away that with you when you left. So that's what I, I'm hoping for. But I also think there's an interesting art experiment, almost like these like Sleep No More or, or Escape Rooms or something like that. Like I thought it would be cool <laughs> to surprise people with this idea. Like, guess what? Uh, you have to put your phone in this pouch, and maybe even people will get mad and demand their money back. I thought that would be funny, but uh, you know. We'll, but I think it's a good, good experiment. I don't mind being the guinea pig. We'll no, see what I happens. look forward to. It could uh, be a disaster. We'll hey, see. listen, I've I've been on the front lines myself. I, <laughs> one of the coolest things I've seen. You and I had a, another moment uh, backstage at Coachella, a couple, three, four years ago when you were headlining, mm. and. My wife and I were sort of uh, loitering back there, and, and you were kind of getting warmed up and doing your thing, and I was saying hello to Lalo and a few other dudes, and all of a sudden, somebody said, you know, Jack would like to see you in his trailer, mm. and I came into your trailer, and you were like, let's play some music together, remember? Yeah. And you played like a rainbow song. Yeah. You played, uh, I think there was maybe some fear there was like some punk stuff. Yeah. Like it was a really eclectic, cool set list as you were kind of uh, warming up to go out and play. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest shows any of us can do, which is headline Coachella on a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And those were baseball bat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a baseball bat that entered the equation. And there was a, a few things that ended up at the receiving end of the baseball bat as it was sort of being swung around yeah. in the air in this trailer. That was quite a moment dude i gotta tell you that um is that uh is that gonna happen tonight <laughs> at where you're playing i mean is that part of your always your pre-show ritual or was it just because it was coachella yeah. I th no i think that um there's there's a thing where i i want to have the extreme of all those emotions and i think that's sort of our job and and we some people get a sent get to see some of that on stage get to see some of it in your songs get to see some of it in person like that you know but i think that you know whether it's uh, you know, joy, anger, lust, you know, uh, violence, happiness, laughter. I want the extreme of all of those things. And I think maybe, you know, that back in the day it used to be like, yeah, you know, rock stars party and they do kind of crazy shit back there and they got two girls each and they're, you know, drinking shit and high shit. 
<laughs> that that stuff didn't appeal to me. What I what appealed to me was they get to they get the freedom to have the highest of each emotion. Like so, you get to have uh, you guys gonna laugh your ass off all night long. Uh, you get to yeah, you can ha- have a lustful situation. You get to have a violent situation. I went and saw Iggy Papa with the Stooges on Australia backstage, and I just I had talked to him earlier in the day. We got lunch together, and um, we had some great conversations about music and. And um, that night, I, he was about to go on stage, and, I, and then someone invited him to come in and say hi. And I came and said hi, and they were talking about some old muscle cars. And I said something about, yeah, I have a 60 Thunderbird like that. And I looked over, and Iggy goes, oh, really? <laughs> and he's looking at me like, I'm like, what the? Is he going to fight me right now? He looked like he was going, he was about to fight me. And I'm like, I, I was like, all right. And I got out of the room and I was talking to one of the Ashton brothers. I'm like, I didn't say anything wrong, did I? He goes, no, no, no. He's just getting in, he's just getting in the mood right now. He, this is, this is a fight. I was like, that's how I feel, man. This is great. I, like, I got confused because it's one of my idols. And so I was like, well, I've got to, I've got to stop being, you know, like, you know, shaking, shaking old ladies' hands and kissing babies before I go on stage. I gotta get, I gotta get into this I, hardcore before I go out there. I want it to be a fight. I want to overcome obstacles. I, I gotta tell you, it was a fucking rock and roll moment. <laughs> 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 it really was with the, that baseball bat, Nashville '09, I guess, on Death Magnetic. I came over to your to third man. We're hanging out. You're showing me around. Super cool. Mm-hmm. We had a show the next day. I don't know, Indianapolis, somewhere, whatever, and. So we had a lobby call at like three o'clock in the afternoon yeah. and I get down to the lobby and my tour manager comes over and he says, uh, one of Jack White's people called this morning and wanted to see if you and Trujillo wanted to come over and jam with him. But we decided to let you sleep. <laughs> I was like, what the f***? <laughs> I was like, okay. I told my tour manager, next time Jack White calls and wants to jam with me, you know, f- Wake my ass up. I'm going to take that one one step further. Since you're sitting here, next time you want to jam with me in Trujillo, give me a heads up and I'll f-ing be there with bells and whistles awesome, on. Awesome, man. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Thank you. It was great to this. talk to you. It's so it's so different to talk to a musician, too. Uh, I mean, I could talk to you for three more hours right now. And, and guess be, what? I could great. talk to you for another <laughs> three more hours. But uh, I hope uh, you have a great show tonight. Thanks. Congratulations on an insane record. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. Thanks a lot.